Hello and welcome to Worship with St. Paul Presbyterian. I'm Anna Lehos, the Worship and Music Elder here at St. Paul. Pastor Bill is off this week, but he'll be back in the proverbial pulpit on Monday, January 4th. It is my pleasure to welcome you to worship with us and we wish you and your family a very happy new year. Since Pastor Bill is enjoying some well-deserved R&R, our sermon today features guest preacher Adam Hamilton of the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City. He will be preaching on Emmanuel in the midst of a pandemic based on Isaiah chapter 7 verses 14 through 164 and Matthew chapter 1 verses 20 through 23. We are looking forward to our next sermon series starting January 10th exploring many ways that God is holding our lives. Written over a span of time from exile and isolation to the rebuilding of the community, the poetry of the Psalms will accompany us in this series, reminding us that through it all, we can find comfort and even rejoice because God is indeed holding our lives. And now, as we begin our service, I invite you to slow down and remember why we are here. Take a few deep breaths and invite the presence of the unhurried, unpanicked God into our lives. Let us worship the Lord and join in song wherever you are with our first hymn, The First Noel. sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times in our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message.
as we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words from scripture. First from the book of Isaiah, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. The Lord will bring upon you, upon your people and upon your families, days unlike any that have come since the day Ephraim broke away from Judah, the king of Assyria. And in Matthew's gospel, we read, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. I want to begin by welcoming all of the congregations who are using this sermon across the United States. Uh, it's a joy. We offered this to pastors so they'd have a chance to just have a little bit of a break and uh, during this season. And uh, I'm thrilled to be joining you as your guest preacher, even as I'm preaching to the Church of the Resurrection here in the Kansas City area. Thank you for allowing me to join you and allowing us to be a part of your ministry today. So we're in the midst of a series of sermons in which we've been focusing on incarnation, rediscovering the meaning of Christmas. And we've been looking at the titles that were given to Jesus in the nativity stories in the gospels. So in Matthew and Luke's gospel and their story of the birth of Jesus, and also in the prologue to John's gospel. And today we're gonna focus our attention on that title, Emmanuel. And we're gonna come to understand what it means and how it impacts our lives and what it calls forth from us today. But I wanna begin by recognizing that we live in a time in which there's a lot of fear, anxiety in the air, and that relates to the adversity that we're experiencing in life. So uh, in the last month, we have seen the number of COVID cases increasing dramatically. We've seen the number of deaths increasing. We've seen hospitals that were overflowing in places. I've been talking with hospital workers in the last week, and they've been describing how exhausted they are mentally, physically, emotionally exhausted. And, and the numbers just keep rising for them. And, and then looking at people who are working in other frontline positions, especially those who are working in with senior adults in assisted living in particular in, uh, in skilled care centers where, where people are working for modest incomes and never imagined that they were gonna be putting their lives in harm's way as they go in to work every day. I mean, it's exhausting. One, one uh, area skilled, ser, uh, skilled care center near us, uh, 24 people with COVID right now in, in that nursing care center. I mean, this is exhausting for people. And for the rest of us, you know, we're, we're tired of social isolation. We're tired of not being with each other. We're, we're tired of being afraid. We experience this in our lives. And, uh, and so a, a study was done last month. The Gallup organization had done a survey in 2019 asking Americans to describe their mental health. And then they repeated the same study in November of 2020. And what they found was that the number of people who described themselves as having excellent mental health, which is actually a majority of Americans, described themselves as having excellent mental health. But the number who said that in 2020 had declined by nine points nine points. And in some categories, some groups of people, it had declined by 15 points. Now, what was interesting is there was only one group of people, one category of people who actually reported that their numbers, you know, the number of people who were uh, reporting themselves as excellent, uh, their mental health is excellent, uh, grew by four points. Uh, it was up instead of down were people who were regular churchgoers, not just regular, weekly churchgoers. So regular didn't really count, didn't make much of a difference, but weekly churchgoers reported that, that you know, the numbers of people who reported they had excellent mental health up by four points, which tells us that there's some connection between mental health and well-being and our faith and a, and a deeply devout faith in which we are weekly seeking to worship God. So we're gonna to try to unpack that today as well. So I wanna remind you again, we're gonna talk about Emmanuel. Emmanuel comes from a Hebrew word, which means God is with us. God is with us. Can you say that with me? 
God is with us. If, uh, if, if somebody asks you, what does Emmanuel mean? You're going to know the answer. Emmanuel means God is with us. And this word, unlike the other titles for Jesus, which appear over and over again in scripture, this word appears only two times in the entire Bible. The very first time is about 700 years before Jesus is born, 735 years before Jesus is born, 735 BC. And it's Isaiah who's living and ministering in and around Jerusalem. And he speaks this word as a promise from God and a sign from God will be a child whose name will be called Emmanuel. I want to, I want to help you understand the historical context for that. And then it'll help us understand why Jesus is called Emmanuel. So in 735 BC, the Holy Land had been divided. Israel had been divided into two smaller kingdoms. The Northern Kingdom was called Israel. Its capital was Samaria. The Southern Kingdom was called Judah. Its capital was Jerusalem. Let me show you on a map. So uh, this is what had been the kingdom of Israel, which is now two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel you see here and the kingdom of Judah you see here. All right, they're cousins, they're, they're all family and yet they can't get along. And then there's another kingdom I want you to notice, it's the kingdom of Aram up here, all right? So what happens in 735 BC is the kingdom of Aram and the kingdom of Israel have said, uh, we are going to throw off the, uh, the bonds of our oppressors, the Assyrian empire. Now the Assyrians had, had allowed them to have some degree of self-rule, but they controlled the area and they collected massive taxes from the people of Aram, the people of Israel and the people of Judah. And so the kings of Aram and Israel said, hey, let's, let's get Judah to join us and we're going to see if we can defeat the Assyrians. And, uh, and when they approached King Ahaz in Jerusalem, they said, hey, will you join us? We're gonna throw off the, you know, the Assyrian power. And Ahaz says, no way. We're just going to be crushed if we do that. We're not, I'm not going to do that. And so the kings of uh, Israel and Aram decided that they would defeat Ahaz. They would battle Ahaz first. They would kill the king, put in a new king who would be favorable to their ideas. And then all three of these kingdoms would fight against the Assyrians. And, and the impact that that had on Ahaz and the people of Jerusalem, it terrified them. So we read this in Isaiah 7 too. The hearts of the people shook as the trees of a forest shake when there is a wind. When they were terrified by these two kingdoms going to come against them uh, and try to overpower them. And it was then that God said to Isaiah, go talk to the king. And this is the message I want you to give him. Listen, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. I mean, what a promise. Ahaz, don't be afraid because those two kingdoms are going to be destroyed. You don't have to worry about them. And this little boy who's about to be born, so this isn't a prophecy in Isaiah's mind or Ahaz's mind about a baby who would be born 735 years later. It's about a woman who's pregnant then. And it might've been the king's, one of the king's wives in his harem. It might've been the prophet's wife, but somebody's pregnant. And, and Isaiah says, and she's going to have a baby boy. And you're to call that name. She's going to call that child Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And he will be a sign to you that God is with you. So you don't have to be so afraid in the face of these two kingdoms threatening you. And, and then he says, and I promise you this, that before the child is old enough, you know, before he's old enough to choose right from wrong, which could have been three or four years old, it could have been 13 years old, just sort of age when you become a grown up that before he reaches that age, these two kingdoms will be destroyed. So, so this was a word of hope. And I wanted to show you on a map here what happens next. So, uh, so here again, we have Judah down here in this area and we have Israel up in this area over here and we have Aram up here. And uh, these two start marching against uh, the kingdom of Israel. And, uh, and in three years, now we're just gonna step back a little bit. Here's Judah, here's Israel, here's Aram. And here is the massive kingdom of Assyria. And when they try to throw off the, the, the uh, taxes of the Assyrians, the Assyrian army comes with their king and they destroy the kingdom of Aram. And 12 years later, 10 years later, they come and they destroy the kingdom of Israel, leaving only Judah and its capital. I'll just take it here. Take it. Leaving only Judah and its capital of Jerusalem intact. intact. The very thing that God had promised for Isaiah and that that child was to bear witness to, that God is with you, he is Emmanuel, and before he's old enough to, to know right from wrong, these two kingdoms will be destroyed, happened. It happened in 722 BC when the Northern Kingdom of Israel was destroyed. All right, so that was the prophecy. But listen, it had a much deeper meaning to Matthew. So Matthew is writing his gospel, maybe 60, 70 years after Jesus is born. And Jesus has died. He's risen from the grave. He's been in heaven for 40 years. And Matthew is writing this gospel and he's telling the story of the birth of Jesus. And when he's trying to help his readers understand the significance of Christmas, the significance of Jesus, 
And we are his modern day readers. He wants us to understand this. This is what he does. He draws from this obscure text in Isaiah chapter seven. And then this is what we read. As he's telling the story of the birth of Jesus, he says this. Now all of this, that is the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I love that. Now, a couple of things have changed. Emmanuel is spelled with an E instead of an I because it's from the Greek instead of the Hebrew. Same word though. Uh, and, and in this text, the young woman who was going to have a child is now a virgin. So the word is, you know, he's looking now at Mary who is a virgin. And so he's seeing this and the young woman then is a virgin. Now it's the Virgin Mary and she's going to give birth. And this child will be named Emmanuel. Now, Mary doesn't call Jesus Emmanuel. Nobody calls him Emmanuel in the New Testament. This word only appears once in Matthew's gospel as Matthew is trying to tell us the significance of the birth of this child. So here's what I want us to recognize. He wants us to get this that Jesus was God with us in a much deeper and more profound way than that child who lived in Isaiah and Ahaz's day. And this is where we get to the idea of the incarnation. The incarnation to incarnate means to enflesh, right? If you have chili con carne, it's chili with meat. And so to incarnate means to put meat on something, on an idea, a concept, a truth, or in this case on God, that God has taken on flesh in Jesus He's been born like one of us, as one of us, to walk among us, to show us that God exists, to say, God is with you. Jesus is the sign. He is, a, he is the, the very incarnation of God to say to all who believe in him, God is, and God is with you. And this is what God is like. And this is God's will for your life. And God suffers and dies that you might know grace and forgiveness. And God is raised from the dead to say, Jesus is raised from the dead to say that the worst thing isn't the last thing. And there's always hope. All of this is bound up in Jesus. Right? God has come to us in Jesus. It's a, it's a mind-boggling concept, and I'll tell you, it is, the, it is the scandal of the Christian faith. Like any other faith, any other religion out there, the idea for Judaism, for Islam, that God would actually become flesh, it's scandalous. But it, it is our scandal that God cared enough about human beings that God would seek to help us know that he is with us all the time, to know what he's like and know his will for our lives. So, you know, God is everywhere. God, God, God it, you know, infuses the entire cosmos and stands outside of it. Did all of God get, get you know, become incarnate in the, in the babe Jesus? No, the essence of God, the essential stuff of God is in Jesus. And at the same time, God still permeates everything. And Christians talk about this in terms of the Trinity, right? Another mind-boggling, mind-blowing concept that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, and God the Son enters into human flesh. Right? God has come to us in Jesus. And when he grows up, he does all the kinds of stuff that only God can do. He walks on water. He, he calms the wind and the waves and the storms. He opens the eyes of the blind. He raises the dead. Right? And he forgives sins. And he speaks with authority because he speaks as God himself enfleshed in our midst. I had a, a woman I spoke to this week. Uh, she had reached out to me on Facebook as a regular part of our congregation. She lives in another state, but she worships with us every week. And she said, uh, Pastor, I just am struggling with my faith. I lost a good friend and I am really, I'm struggling. Again, I just want to know, why doesn't God just show up? If God would just show up, I mean, how, why is it so hard? Why doesn't God just show up? And I said, you know, you, you ask a question that many people have asked me before. And a young man asked me this earlier this last year. He asked me, uh, a college student, he said, I just, you know, want to know, like, have you ever seen God, Adam? And I said, uh, well, you know, first of all, you got to remember God, it, God permeates the entire universe, which is 93 billion light years across. A light year is how fast light travels at 186,000, or how far light travels at 186,000 miles a second across the course of a year. And there were 93 billion light years across and God fills all of that. So it'd be like asking me, have I ever seen air? I don't see air, but I breathe it. I experience it. I'm alive because of it. That's how I think about God. He permeates everything. But I look around at the creation all around me and I think that's evidence of God. I mean, look, this, this, this universe is ordered and it's beautiful and it's mathematical and, it's, and all of this points me towards the God who, in whom I live and move and have my being according to the Apostle Paul. So, so then I said, uh, in addition to that, I felt God's presence in my life. And I, I turned to this woman, I said, you know, have you ever felt God's presence? And she nodded and she said, yes, on our Zoom call. She said, yes, I, I do feel God's presence. And I said, me too. There are moments where I felt like God nudged me to do something and I did it and I was just in the right place at the right time. And, and I felt myself right in the middle of what God was doing. And there are times I hear the still small voice of God and sometimes I feel overwhelmed by the love of God and sometimes I feel nothing. But I felt enough, enough times that I feel like I've seen God in my experiences of God. 
I said, then I think about, and the primary way that I see God is through Jesus. Because as Christians, we believe that God came and took on flesh and lived among us, walked as a human being. And so the gospel writers saw him, or, you know, not all of them, but several of the gospel writers, if Matthew and Mark uh, were a part of the, you know, were actually written by Matthew and Mark, if John was written by John, then they saw Jesus, right? And, and, the, and the apostles and everyone who was ministered to by him, they saw him. And when they looked at him, they saw God. So Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and Paul says, in him, all of the fullness of God dwelt bodily or dwelt, dwelt in bodily form. So we Christians, we look at Jesus, we say, yeah, we've seen God. We see him in, this, you know, in the stories of what he did when he walked on this earth. We see what God is like and who God is and God's will for our lives. That's the incarnation. And, and then I shared with this young man earlier this year, I said, you know, but here's the thing. When God came and actually did what you'd like him to do, that he just showed up, you know what human beings did to him? like the most pious human beings among his people. They accused him of blasphemy and they crucified him. That's what happened when God showed up in the way we would like. So we look at Jesus and we believe and we trust in him and we say that God is with us. He is Emmanuel. He came to remind us God is with us all the time. And Jesus said before he left, you might not see me, but I'm with you all the time, even to the end of the age. And so in my own life, when I face fear and anxiety and adversity, and I feel those all the time, you know, I put my trust in him. I say, Jesus, I'm yours. I trust that you're with me. I, I trust that you are the person that I read about in the gospels and you show me what God is like because you are God, the son. And, and when I sing, when I pray, when I worship, I find his peace begins to come into my life. When I'm opening the gospels and I read those stories. Several months ago, I shared a, a sermon in which I, I sang to you a part of a song. I sing it all the time, not all the time, but I sing it quite, quite frequently. It comes from Isaiah chapter 12, verse two and following. And I'm not a very good singer, but when I sing this, I've been singing it this week. When I feel my heart anxious and I sing it, I find a peace. It goes like this. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense. And he will be my savior. I sing that over and over again sometimes. And all of a sudden I feel his presence and I know he is my savior and he's my stronghold and my sure defense. And I'm not afraid when I put my trust in him. Jesus came to show us what God is like, that God is with us and that God ultimately will triumph over whatever it is that stands before us. I want to remind you, human beings have always been afraid and, and fear is a good thing. I mean, it helps us, it saves us and protects us, but often we fear things that never come to pass, right? Or, or that fear is debilitating instead of leading us to action. So I was looking at what people are afraid of right now. And, and this week I was looking at several surveys that had come out in, in October and November, 55% of Americans, and actually it fluctuates between 50 and 65% of Americans are afraid of contracting COVID. That's pretty understandable. So that's meant to lead us to wear our masks and to be careful about where we're, you know, how, how we're engaging with one another. 65% of Americans over age 40 are afraid of dementia and losing their losing faculties. A record number of Americans right now are afraid of being victims of a crime. And what's particularly interesting about that is while we have a record number of people afraid of being victims of a crime, the number of people who actually report being victims of a crime is at a 20-year low. So somehow what we're afraid of and what the reality is is often very, very different. Uh, contracting COVID, you have a very small chance of contracting COVID, especially if you're careful. And then a much smaller chance of dying from COVID. But, but the fears take hold in our lives anyway. We fear other things. We fear not being loved. We fear being rejected. We fear being alone. We fear darkness and meaninglessness and purposelessness. So I want to remind you of God's consistent words in scripture to people who are afraid. Isaiah 41, 10, God says, don't fear because I am with you. Don't be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you with my righteous right hand. Don't you love that? God's speaking that. You read those words and you meditate upon them and you recognize God is promising that to you as well. He's saying that to the children of Israel in the midst of a very dark time for them. In Genesis 26, 24, when Isaac, Isaac was harassed by the Philistines, God appeared to him in a dream and said this, don't be afraid because I am with you. Right? He might not be able to see God, but God was promising, I promise you I'm with you. Or, uh, or when the Israelites were preparing to enter the promised land and Joshua offers these words to the Israelites, you know, yes, the people are giants in the land and there's fortified cities, but listen, don't be alarmed or terrified, he says, because the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. 
Right? Or, or when Jesus uh, saw his disciples in the distance, they were on the Sea of Galilee in their fishing boat in the middle of the night and the storms were coming and, and they were afraid they were going to be lost at sea and Jesus walks on the water. And do you remember what he says to them? Don't be afraid because I'm with you. I'm with you. And of course, the psalmist repeated this again and again and we've repeated his words many times. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's when we trust in God, we're not afraid. We remember that he's our stronghold. We remember that he came to us in Jesus. And because he came to us in Jesus, we trust that God is. Because we see what Jesus did, what he said, we see his death and his resurrection. We trust that God loves us, that God cares about us, that God forgives us, that God can heal us, that God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. We, we remember that no matter what happens, the worst thing is never the last thing because God came to us in Jesus, Emmanuel, he was the sign. He was the one who incarnated the very presence of God for us. Our granddaughter, Stella, is six years old. She spent the night on Tuesday night, and uh, she does every Tuesday night. And I, was, I do a Vespers from 9.30 to 10 o'clock, or I'm sorry, from uh, 7.30 to 8 o'clock Central Time on Facebook Live. And I was, uh, had just finished the Vespers, and I told uh, this last Tuesday night, I said, you know, uh, my granddaughter, I'm getting ready to put her to bed, and, and we pray together, and then, and then uh, I know somewhere in the middle of the night, there's a high likelihood she's going to wake up with a bad dream and come wake me up. And sure enough, that's what happened. So I went to put her to bed after the Vespers and I read to her from Charlotte's Web. Then I read to her two Bible stories and then, and then we turned off the lights and I prayed with her and kissed her goodnight. And we, we, uh, that night I said, you know, I know sometimes you have bad dreams, but I just want you to remember Jesus is here to rescue you. He's here to save you. He's your deliverer. He loves you. Just remember he's here. Just remember he's with you all the time. And, uh, and then we prayed the Lord's Prayer together and uh, I told her goodnight. And so, you know, three in the morning, I, I went to bed about midnight, three in the morning, I hear a voice next to my bed and Stella says, Papa, are you awake? Papa, are you awake? <laughs> well, I am now, honey. What do you need? She said, I had a bad dream. And LaVon woke up and she said, hey, let me take her to bed because I know you just came to bed. I said, no, this is one of my favorite things about being a papa. And I swooped her up in my arms and I carried her upstairs and I laid her carefully in her bed. I laid next to her for a minute and I took her hand and I said, Stella, I want you to remember, Jesus is here with you all the time. You don't have to be afraid. Now, here's the thing about children, about all of us, really, is even though we know Jesus is with us all the time, he is Emmanuel, God with us, sometimes we need people with flesh to help us remember that. I remember a, a pastor once uh, told a story of uh, his little girl who was um, scared in the middle of the storm at night, and she came, the pitter-patter of her little feet, and she came in, and, Papa, Daddy, uh, not Papa, but Daddy, Daddy, you know, I'm scared of the storm, and and he said, honey, you know, you don't have to be afraid. It's just a storm and Jesus is with you and he's stronger than the storm. And she said, I know Jesus is with me, but right now I need somebody with skin. Well, there are times where we need people with skin to remind us that God is and that he's with us. And there are times that people you know and many people you don't know need someone with skin to come along to embody God's love, to embody Christ's presence, to be Emmanuel for them, like Emmanuel of Isaiah's day. Right, to remind them by our actions and our words that God is with us. Can I give you a few examples? So Paul, first of all, captures this idea and he says this is really what it means to be the church. So Paul describes the work of God's people working together, living out their faith in the world, and he calls us the body of Christ. We are the physical incarnation of Jesus in the world. That's what it means to be the church. So every church is meant to be that for each other. We are Christ for each other. We are reminders that God is with us. And then we go out and we live out our faith in such a way that the world can see God. The world can see Jesus through us and how we live our lives. I saw that this last week I was uh, visiting with a few folks at a nonprofit organization called COVID uh, Care Force. So COVID Care Force was started by a man named Gary Morsh, a remarkable guy. He's a physician and, and uh, he started a group, an organization called Heart to Heart, mobilizing doctors and, and pharmaceutical companies to be able to deliver medical care and medications in disaster areas around the world. And, uh, and then this year, he started this new nonprofit non called COVID Care Force. And he did so because he recognized that there were Native American communities across the United States who were experiencing COVID positive uh, diagnoses at a rate 3.5 times higher than the rest of the population, than the general population. 
And so he said, you know, we've got to do something about this. But there are areas where there weren't very many doctors or nurses and people live some distance from each other. And some places not even served by electricity, even to this day in, in the United States. And so he thought, I wonder if I could get volunteers, nurses and doctors, respiratory therapists to volunteer to go to these communities. He found he didn't need as many doctors as he thought, but he did need more nurses than he thought. And since that, since they've sent out 40 teams of nurses who take two weeks vacation to go out and work with people who may be COVID positive or may be at risk of being COVID positive to care for them. Respiratory therapists for those who are sick have been diagnosed with COVID. And so uh, all of these folks have been sending out, it's really just an amazing, amazing story. I wanted to see a few of the pictures. So uh, here's a couple of these folks who are serving in one of the communities. So they're in Colorado, uh, they're in New Mexico, Arizona, uh, they're in South Dakota and, uh, and in Oklahoma. So I'm not sure where these guys are, but two young people have gone out to say, I'm here to serve people at no, they, they get no salary from this. Let's go to the next picture. And, uh, and I love this. This is a nun at the St. Joseph Center. I'm not even sure which state she's in. And she's got two of these young nurses who are volunteering or respiratory therapists who are volunteering to work with the people in her community. Let's go to the next one. And I love these nurses who are there at Winslow Indian Healthcare Center. You know, and they've taken time away from their families and time away from work. They're taking vacation time to go out and care for people who didn't have access to a nurse. And then this last one, I, I love this group of young people you who know, have all taken time off of, of the day jobs that they have and what are they doing? And what do you see when you see those pictures? What they're doing is they're being Emmanuel for other folks. They're being Emmanuel for people they don't even know to come along and say, look, I'm with you. And I came out here to care for you. And in the process of that, to help people not be afraid, to, to dial down the anxiety and to help them find hope. They are Emmanuel for the people they're ministering to. Why am I sharing this story? Because there's 30,000 of you who are watching this sermon. And, and my hunch is that there are, well, right now, COVID Care Force says they need 100 more nurses to go out for two-week stints over the next couple of months. I'm just wondering if there aren't 100 nurses who are watching this sermon right now. And God may be saying to you, hey, you know, I'm talking to you. There are people out there who need Emmanuel. Can you go be Emmanuel? Can you embody my presence and my love? Can you put flesh put skin on my love for them, and that when they feel your love and care, they're going to know somehow, maybe you are able to bear witness to your faith in such a way. Maybe it's just a cross you're wearing, but somewhere along the way, maybe it's saying, can I pray with you after you're done treating them? But to be able to let them see that you've come because Christ has called you to be there. And that changes things. And can I tell you a secret? When you do that, it brings joy to you. You find your own fear is dissipated your meaning is increased and the sense of being a part of what God is doing in the world just grows exponentially. When you say, here I am, Lord, send me. So I, I think about other ways that, that we have tried to do this as a congregation. And by the way, it doesn't matter where you are across the country. Look up Google search COVID care force. They'll take you wherever you are. By the way, they're also needing uh, four cars donated, uh, really good mechanically uh, in cars in good mechanical condition because they've been renting cars out there for these nurses who fly out there. So, so if you have a car that you'd be willing to donate that's in really good shape, you know, Google search and let them know, hey, I heard about this on, at Church of the Resurrection. I'm willing to donate this car. If, if you live in the Kansas City, that'll be, Kansas City area, it'll be easier to donate a car. But if you're a nurse, you can come from anywhere across the United States to go out and serve. All right, so I think about some other things we've tried to do here at Church of the Resurrection. And I know all of you churches that are joining us and, and uh, where I'm serving as a guest preacher today, you're doing the same kinds of things. I just wanna just remind our congregation a few of these things. So uh, I had conversations with area school superintendents about a month ago, and they said, you know, our teachers are really, they're, they're discouraged. They're trying to teach kids on, uh, online and you know, that, they weren't trained for that and it's, it's not always going well. And then they're worried about their kids getting further behind. And, and you know, some of the schools came back and then they, then they ended up canceling again. And, and I said, well, what can we do? And they said, well, you know, is there any way you could just encourage our people? I'm like, well, we can do that. All right, so, so we ended up getting signs you know, made up and we put signs in front of schools and we did a host of other things. But then, then after that, we said, well, what more can we do? And they said, you know, what about notes of encouragement? So we started with the Kansas City, Missouri public school system. You know, they were the first ones to say, hey, we'll take notes. Man, we'd love to have notes from your people. So I, on a Sunday about a month ago, I said, are there 130 of you who would be willing to write notes, 25 to 50 notes each to teachers and, and staff members at these schools? We didn't have 130 people who said yes. We had 564 people who said yes. I just want you to see some of them writing these notes. So I love this, you know, they're there and they're, they're writing the notes and addressing the envelopes and, and sealing them and, you know, praying over this whole process. Here's, here's some of the notes and what they look like, you know, to, in the next picture, the, 
You know, so these are, these are teachers in Olathe School District because after we'd finished Casey Mo, we had so many volunteers, we found Olathe said, well, we'll take some notes too. And so we wrote to every school teacher in Olathe as well. And, and then Bonner Springs heard about it, another school district out here in Kansas City. They said, hey, could you write notes to us too? And so these same people are writing these notes to Bonner Springs. And I'm sure there'll be other school districts we'll be sending these notes to. To every single employee in the school district, or at least every teacher I know, I think to the employees as well. We're praying for you. We thank you for what you're doing. You matter. And you know what they're doing? They're coming along to try to be Emmanuel, to remind people that God is with you. I mean, these are church people who are writing these things that remind them God is with you and you're gonna make it through this. And God sees what you're doing and shines, you know, his face shines upon you. I love that. As I was preparing to share this sermon, I was getting ready to come preach and I received an email from one of our guys. His name is Bruce Gaddis and he's in the food ministry and, and he just couldn't help himself. He just had to send me these pictures from the food warehouse. You know, we have a whole warehouse where we, where we you know, deliver the food. We purchase mass quantities. You know, you all usually deliver food here, but because we're not meeting, we're not person, we're now buying food. And, and he said, Pastor Adam, I just want you to know, it's just so awesome. You know, we're gonna be delivering all this food to four area food pantries. We support dozens of food pantries in Kansas City, but you know, this is going to four. We're gonna deliver it by, you know, by the end of this weekend. And I just wanted you to see, these were the pictures he sent. And when I looked at that, you know, all this food, you know what I see there? I see Emmanuel. I see families who are afraid that they're not going to be able to feed their kids because they don't have any, mo- any money. They've run out of, run out of money. They're, they've lost their jobs. They're, they're scared. I see those families and I see them receiving this food at these area food pantries, including Resurrections Food Pantry. And I, I, I imagine them feeling for a moment, not afraid and peace and loved and like somehow it's gonna be okay. And I hope they feel God is with us. These church people gave us this food to feed our families. God is with us. You see, sometimes people need someone with skin to make real the truth that God is always with us. And God uses human beings to do his delivering work and his healing work and his helping work. And when we do that, we bring hope to other people we reduce their fear and give them peace and we find joy in our own lives. I want to end with a story. This week, I received a text from a woman in our congregation, a young woman in her 30s, and, and her husband had died three years ago in November, died of cancer. And she said, you know, Pastor Adam, one of my best friends is now dying. I just, just found that, that, this out this week and I, I, uh, I feel like God wants me to go and fly to where she is halfway across the country and to, and to just be there with her. And, you know, is there anything you think I should say? Like, I've looked at your book, Why, and I'm taking it with me, and I'm just trying to figure out what, what are the things I should say, you know, to her. And, and so I texted her back, and I said, uh, it's not so much about what you say. Now, here are some things you, you know, here are some things that you might, you know, you, you could say. But I said, it's not really about what you say. It's about you being there. We call this the ministry of presence. It's showing up. It's putting flesh, putting skin on God's love. It's, 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 it's holding somebody's hand. It's looking them in the eyes and saying that you love them. It's, it's saying, tell me, tell me the stories of your life that, are, that you know, bring you the greatest joy. Or, you know, it, it's not having the answer. Like you're not gonna have the wisdom and the right answer for somebody is dying from cancer. Like it's not God's will. I said that, but make sure you make, sure, you know, make, make it known that this is not God's will. This is part of what happens in life. Cancer happens. And part of our quest as human beings is to find cures for these things and human beings working towards this. And God doesn't promise us that there's not gonna be pain and suffering in this world. How, how could we think that's the promise of God when Jesus came and died at the age of 33, tortured to death on a cross? That's not the promise of God. The promises of God is that no matter what happens, I'm gonna be with you. And when this life is over, I'm gonna be with you. And there is a place where there's no more sorrow or suffering or tears, but until that time, I'm gonna walk with you through hell and back on this earth. And somehow it's going to be okay. I said, just be with her and let her see your love in the silence, in the holding of hands, in the telling of stories, the ministry of presence. And you know what? She went, she sent me pictures of her and her friend. And you know what I saw when I looked at those pictures? I saw Emmanuel, God with us, through Carrie to her friend. I want to ask you, Who has been Emmanuel for you? I mean, clearly Jesus is Emmanuel, but who has embodied his love for you? Who was there when you were walking through a really tough time and they came alongside you? Who reminds you that God loves you and is with you all the time? And then this is the question I want to ask you. Really, I want you to think about this. Is whose Emmanuel will you be? How will you share the love of God and let people know that God is with them 
this season. Here's the invitation I have. Put your trust in Christ. I mean, daily, Lord, I belong to you. I trust you are. I trust you're with me. I trust you're not going to let me go. Then I want you to think about how can you be Emmanuel for someone else? And I want to remind you uh, here at Resurrection, our candlelight Christmas Eve offering. So for those of you at other churches, you may do something similar. At Resurrection, every year we give away the entire candlelight Christmas Eve offering. And some of you may be seeing this sermon after Christmas Eve. But for us, this is before Christmas Eve. And I just want to remind you as a congregation, this year, 100% of what you give is going to be going to be Emmanuel, to offer hope, to let people see that there is a God who loves and cares for them in very tangible ways. We're going to be helping to expand preschools in the urban core here in Kansas City so that children who haven't had access to a pre-K education at will because of what you've done. We're going to be making sure these kids have enough to eat. We're going to be making sure they have enough clothes to wear. We're going to be making sure they have access to medical care. That's the half of the Christmas Eve offering that stays in Kansas City. The half that goes outside of Kansas City, that half is going to be providing for preschool and early childhood education for people in Malawi, 22 little preschools in rural villages in Malawi that you're supporting. So children have a fighting chance at escaping poverty. A a school in Honduras, in a village that was built after a hurricane wiped out everything in the communities that these people came from. It's the only school in the community and you provide support for that. You pay the teacher salaries, provide the scholarships for the kids. A school in Lebanon for Syrian refugees who have No hope other than the fact that they're going to get an education because you're providing that for them. And kids in South Africa living on a trash dump, like the the trash dump for the city just outside of Johannesburg, and they have a preschool there that you help fund. All of this because you chose to give generously in the candlelight Christmas Eve offering in order to be Emmanuel for someone else. Hey, here's the thing. Christ is with you. He is Emmanuel. You don't have to be afraid. He walks with you no matter what but he calls you to be his presence for others. And in that, you find joy. Let's pray. Oh God, how grateful we are to you that you came to us in Jesus. That you came to walk among us in the flesh, to show us who you are, to show us that you are, to help us understand your will for our lives, to know in your suffering and death on the cross that we are forgiven and set free and that in your resurrection, Jesus we find that the worst thing is never the last thing and there's always hope. We trust you. Help us to trust you when we're afraid, to pray, to sing, to worship, to listen. And then, oh Lord, help us to have our eyes wide open to see who is it who needs Emmanuel now? Who is it who needs us to put skin, to put flesh on the truth that you are and on your love so that they might find somehow seen in us your presence your love. Use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week. Out of the beauty and stillness of this sacred space, We invite you to fill the night with hope by supporting the work of St. Paul Presbyterian Church as we give online or mail in our offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, may these tithes and offerings illumine the dark night, warm the cold heart, feed the hungry bodies, and quench the thirsty souls. In the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, amen. is adapted from John Vest. God of wisdom and truth, at the beginning of this new year, we look back and we look forward. In the year that has passed, we experienced joy and we experienced sorrow. We felt blessed and we felt challenged. Some things went by much too fast. 
and some things lingered for far too long. We are reminded that you are present through it all. We are reminded that we are never alone. We are reminded that nothing can separate us from your love. So at the beginning of this new year, we pause to reflect on the year that has passed. We remember the things from this past year that we are most thankful for. We recall the moments we felt happiness, joy, and love. We recall the times we gave and received the most love. We are grateful, God, that you were present in those times. We also remember the things from this past year that we are least thankful for. We recall the moments we were sad, anxious, and afraid. We consider the times we felt life draining from us. We are grateful, God, that you were present in those times too. Gracious God, at the beginning of this new year, we also look forward to the year to come. We are confident that you will be with us still when we are thankful and when we are not, when we are at peace and when we are anxious, when we comfort others and when we need comfort ourselves, when we feel alive and when we feel exhausted, when we give and receive love and when we do not. God, the world we live in is messy and challenging. In a world of pain, help us work for healing. In a world of fear, help us find hope. In a world of violence, help us work for peace. In a world of oppression and injustice, help us become chain breakers. In a world full of human failings, help us not to lose sight of your beauty and wonder that surrounds us. God, you are with us always. So give us grace and give us courage to live faithfully in this imperfect world. Remind us always of the promise of your kingdom emerging around us and through us. And now let us take a few moments to pray silently or to share our requests online in the chat area. Loving God, during this time when we not be able to physically wrap our arms around each other, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors and to remember and remind each other that you are with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not in temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain. Today, I charge you to remember this above all else. 
No matter how frightening the world may become, no matter how frightening your life may be today or may become tomorrow, you need not be afraid. God is among us. God goes before you to guide you. God goes beside you to comfort you. God goes behind you to protect you. God goes beneath you to strengthen you. And God goes above you to give you vision and hope. God, the almighty God, is with us. If you will remember that, then the peace of God that passes all understanding will go with you too. Thank you.